Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Candy Joe and Ernie Silva. Thank you so much for coming. This is real. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all right. for yeah. It's all good. Um, so, in their own words, um, Candy Joe is a multidisciplinary artist with professional experience in theater, dance, makeup, costume design, graphic design, and film editing. And she has a passion for building community through the arts, exploring mm -hmm. the natural world, and learning new skills. She enjoys volunteering at her local library and watching baseball with her husband, Ernie, and their two children. And Ernie has extensive experience performing stand-up comedy and is also an accomplished musician. He has a bachelor's degree in acting from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville and an MFA from USC. During his time at USC, he developed the award-winning award -winning World Traveled Solo Stage Show, Heavy Like the Weight of a Flame. And recently, he and Candy Joe mounted 108 stitches for Glendale's Solo Fest, which is a show on baseball and family ties. Welcome. And uh, you're going to tell us about Good Old Lower East Side. Is it Goals? Yeah, it's Good Old Goals. Already take the lead on that one. Uh, Do it. Goals, goals is, a, is, a, is a tiny organization that sort of, it had been around a while, but it kind of sprouted into action the last time that the um, massive hurricane hit New York and, mm. you know, the, um, basically the entirety of the Lower East Side was on the water. And so this, um, a, a, a very, very dear friend of mine by the name of Maisha Morales, who is a political activist in New York City, uh, we grew up together in Brooklyn. and. Um, she was heavily involved with this organization and and what what that organization did was it you know it it, it extended um help relief to primarily elderly people mm -hmm. on the Lower East side who were obviously impacted by that situation um that was where i first got sort of introduced to it but since then the organization has you know stayed uh, a, a little bit of a staple in the community for helping out the elderly people in the neighborhood. So I thought that might be a cool thing to sort of shout out and help out in whatever ways we could. That's really awesome. Is that something you had been up to taking part of or is that just part of your neighborhood? Well, um, I'm, I'm kind of on the, like I grew up in Brooklyn, so the Low East Side wasn't really my neighborhood, but it was um, very, it, it was a, a snapshot of this mm. neighborhood that I grew up in, you know what I mean. So when Maisha was working there, um, I wanted to to help in any way that I could support that organization because, you know, I knew if she was there, then the organization was doing the right stuff. Awesome. You know, I, want, I I wanted to help. I always wanted to help her. In the good, so. But that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, you know, I I I like to feel like um, a huge bent to to what we would like to do is to always be sort of helping someone out. You know, I think I mean? yeah, it's one of the better things I think we can do. Uh, I think I think it's what's drawn us to each other. <laughs> I would say that's that that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Because I first met you all, I think. I know I was teaching sewing over at H121 and I was teaching you Candy and then Candy Joe and then you invited me to do the show. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, able to or blessed with the opportunity I guess to curate a art exhibit and we have a gallery in the building that we live in at H121 gallery. It's now managed by Glendale Arts who is who is our partners in the solo fest nice so it's nice to have somebody down there now who is like regulating exhibits it was completely closed over the pandemic so it's so nice to have art again living but that was a lot of fun to bring you in and see your amazing art fabric art sculptures they just blew my mind and i was like ah, i need her <laughs> i need her in my in my exhibit of the environment and the, and the goddess and the mother and all that juiciness that comes with your work. Thank you so much. I mean, because you were doing such a wonderful one about Mother Earth, right? 
mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. the things that we need to do for her. Yeah, absolutely. But then later on, just recently, you got in touch with me because I was doing a costume for this show that you both put together, yeah, which is right. amazing. 108 stitches. It sort of um, came about because our son wanted to play baseball. Hmm. And Ernie's first answer was absolutely not, which was a shock to me because I was like, wait, didn't you play ball as a kid? Like, why would you want to not let our son do that? That sounds crazy. Um, and then it turns out there's a whole show's worth of information as to why the answer was no. Oh, wow. And and that's like sort of what 108 Stitches became is the is the reasons why his first answer was no. And, and then it evolved out of that. But then he had this crazy idea for a customized jersey that I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> Help with this one. So I called, I called Laura Brody and she made it happen. And it was like four different teams that we were sort of. Basically, yeah. I mean, there were four, four, four different influences, let's say. Yeah, for sure. It yeah. Was you know, um, I am a product of, uh, you know, the 80s slash 90s hip hop generation. And so when it came to the idea of doing something that was indicative of sports, um, all of those influences came rushing in at the same time and all wanted to inhabit, in this case, the same piece of cloth. <laughs> Pretty much. So, um, so, yeah, I was really happy. Who's on it? it? It's, um, well, the front of it. Is, Should I go is get the it? Maybe of, my, go of, my, oh. of the neighborhood that I grew up in, right? Which was Bushwick. And the entirety of the story um, centers itself very much so in stories that happened to me growing up in my neighborhood. Mm. So it only it felt only right that Bushwick should have been the front. The front of it. Because I'm always, actually in all of my shows in one way or another, I kind of, you know, shout Bushwick out and and Bushwick. <laughs> there we are. Right. And then on um, the side of it, you know, is obviously, you know, Mr. Babe Ruth's number himself. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and then on the other side, a flagrant uh, <laughs> shout out to Hank Aaron, you know, and, and all of his brilliance. And then on the back, you know, my my culture, one of my cultural baseball heroes and <laughs> Roberto Clemente, right? So, um, so sort of done like the Puerto Rican flag. Oh yeah. <laughs> so well, in the style of the jersey, also, if, if you don't mind me butting in, is reflective of the Grays, the Grays jersey, right? Yeah. From yeah. The leagues. Yeah. So from, from the first Negro leagues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you know, I, baseball has always had kind of a really specific. Um, place in my genes, if you will, and and a, a huge a huge influence on what the entirety of my childhood was like. So when my son decided that he wanted to play the game, there were a lot of really concerted reasons that I was like, no, I don't want you necessarily, you know, experiencing the what it's like to play, especially youth baseball. But as I started to write the story, you know, it, it's interesting because you get a creative spurt. You, 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 I'm sure you understand this as artists. Like you get a creative spurt, and the initial spurt that you get tells you this is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then the more you evolve it, the more it's like that's not at all. <laughs> when I first started this project at all, and. Um, 108 stitches was very much so like that in that I didn't I didn't realize at all that the show is yes it's about him not wanting his son to play baseball but the show's about a lot more than that and I didn't and I didn't know that going in per se you know what I mean I didn't know that it just kind of manifested itself that way it's like oh I didn't know I was going to talk about this. I know I was going to talk about that. I didn't know that was going to come up and things of that nature. But I guess that's that's so goes the creative process, right? 
yeah, that's a when the muse strikes you, you're just there to listen <laughs> and you to work it through. Yeah, it's funny. It's like as I was writing, because I had the story in my head for years, right? But or the idea of what I thought the story was going to be, I had in my head for years. She did end up eventually letting our son play baseball. Yeah. Spoiler, alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> right. But um, I didn't, you know, I, it's funny, like you start to write it and, and whatever we call it, the muse, the inspired voice, whatever it is, starts to go, oh, I'm sorry. Did you think that's what this was about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Uh, I appreciate the thought, but this is what you write now. <laughs> nice try. You know? <laughs> this is when it takes you over. Exactly. And, you know, and then it becomes about... all kinds of other things. Oh, I know. And then by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know, so but you I, I just, this story was no different than that. Sweet. But you two have been working together, putting together shows of your shows, Ernie, but both of you as a team, mm -hmm. since pretty much you've known each other? Pretty close, yeah, yeah pretty <laughs> close to the, the start of our relationship. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, when I had just graduated from USC, um, I had just finished my MFA there, and I was literally living in my car. Like I was, I was literally living in my car, you know, so I didn't have anything. I didn't have jobs coming out of school, even the place where I was living instantaneously became too expensive to maintain and things of that nature. So I was living you know, in the car, but at the same time with this weird dichotomous sort of existence was that the artistic director at the Odyssey Theater had, um, agreed to produce my first show mm. right out of college so wow. i was doing this show at the same time that i was doing this show i was living literally in my so candy came to see the show with a mutual married couple that we know and we've been hanging out ever since that night where that relates to the show though is that um you know after the run finished there were little tiny things that were happening like okay well then i got invited to do it in new york and then i got invited to do it in new york again and then you know blah blah blah. but when we would be back here on the home front you know um you're always tasked with the well it's your work and nobody else is going to do it for you so you have to do it yourself which meant that a, a, a couple of the first times that i was doing the show I was trying to go the traditional route, right? Like you gotta hire a stage manager, you gotta hire this, you gotta hire a house manager, blah, 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 this and the third. Sometimes the stage manager and the house manager perform the same job and stuff. And then that starts to get expensive and having different experiences with it, like literally having uh, stage managers that you hire and then they not even show up the night of the show. So now you have the lights or what have you other people being really good at their job but pricing out of your range right and so candy was and he's very handy with a lot of different things as soon as she decides to learn something you know she's kind of pretty handy with the things that she thought, oh well, yeah if this is what a stage manager does i think that i can do this so she, we started to sort of go that route and it was like okay we'll take the little bit of monies that we have and rent the space now we got to try to promo it and promo it and promo it ourselves. And at times, you know, there would be, we would be lucky and there'd be 40 people that would show up to see the show. And then other nights, no one would show. Right? Like literally, it'd be showtime, doors open, all the seats empty, you know, of a, of a 25 seat house. You know what I mean? Right. It was even a small like it was even a small with. venue. And so it, it ran yeah. the whole of the gamut like that. And now it's grown. You know, it's definitely grown. But we that was our reality for a while. That makes sense. So it was a way to like save money and also for me to just stay next to him because I don't ever want to leave his side. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a real bonding experience. If you can work well together, that makes such a huge difference. And they, I know people who get frustrated by it, but there are reasons why teams work together a lot because you can trust each other. Right. And, and that matters. Like, how did you start Solo Fest together? How did that work? Well, so we had um, the good fortune of having Glendale Arts as our fiscal sponsor. Nice. For a few years. Um, and that helped us to kind of start getting the engines revving post COVID and trying to get back out into the world and doing things. And it was Ernie's idea to, to have a festival and he spoke with Nina and Maria about it. And they came up with the plan. And the, they're the people over at Glendale Arts? At Glendale Arts, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have been interested in the idea of doing a, a solo festival because like, you know, in almost any other genre of performance, mm -hmm. um, there are a trillion different things that can influence what ends up being chosen to do something, right? Yeah, yeah. And for, for, for various reasons, right? But I, I always felt like solo show work was something that I kind of wanted to highlight because, you know, when you see solo show artists, because it's only them at the center of what they're doing, you get to see people in their entire truth. Like, this is what I want to say, how I mean to say it. Nobody's editing me. I don't have to change this because there is a network that does not want that kind of language or content or idea or political view or whatever. No, it's just you on stage with your story. And it, 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 it's a genre where people can be just totally honest about what they want to say. And, and, and the irony of it is that, like, in my experience, audiences really appreciate that. They just yeah. they really do, which is odd, right? Because you don't see that necessarily being rewarded a lot in sort of bigger platforms, if you will, you know? So, I was attracted to that idea. I brought it to Glendale Arts. We sat down with them and we talked it over. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. And they said, okay, you do what you want to do. And I went, okay, let's see how much they mean it. <laughs> and there's that. <laughs> and I have to say, they did. Awesome. To this day, they have been 100%. They don't censor us. They don't look over our shoulders. They don't question us. They don't double. No, it, it's listen, this is what we're doing. Great. You find the artists. I trust you. You guys do you. And it's been fantastic in that regard, man. Yeah, because That's we've been doing this work or we've been doing this work so long. There's like, there's a nice trusted like following of there's more and more people coming out of the woodwork to be like wait i have a story to share too i want to write i want to write a solo piece and uh ernie had already started directing which is fun congratulations thank you that was scary <laughs> it's still scary every time that i do it because like it's it's a strange it's a strange and beautiful thing at the same time because there are like artists that have come to see me work and they kind of think of my work in a certain way which is flattering and you know um, something that makes me feel totally honored and a few of those artists came and they were like look i want you to direct what i'm doing wow and i'm like i don't know how to do that <laughs> but um i'm gonna try but I, I i gave it a shot and, and so far it's worked out well i think i've i've directed about four shows now at this point or four solo shows what do you like about that versus doing the uh, putting the shows together versus doing my yeah. own mm -hmm. um well there's a lot of things to like about it for one um it, it teaches you about your own process right because like i don't really like to think of myself too much as like 
oh, now I'm a director. I'm going to put my hat on and you do this and you say this and you say that. It's more so like, what is that person trying to say or communicate with this moment? And how do I bring my creative spurs to helping them to do that? And then standing out of the way and being like, okay, well, now let's see how the audience takes this. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you, at the end of the day, are happy with the end product. And so every time I do it, it's nerve wracking, right? Because it's like, well, this is, I, I'm, I'm, this person entrusted me with their story and their work. And yeah. so now I, I have to hope that I've, you know, that I've succeeded in making them happy with, with whatever the end product is. And so far I've been really lucky. It's wonderful. Yeah. What has it been? Yeah. The goal is to like really bring more of those underserved voices to the forefront. Because so, she stage manages all the shows. So she also gets to bring her creativity to the table with them and cohabitate with the artists and be like, okay, what were you thinking here? This is what I was thinking like this. How about we do this? And how about we, and that's been a lot of fun. You know, it's nerve wracking again, especially this time because I put up a new show myself while I was directly to new one. Madness, <laughs> absolute madness. We yeah, pull, you pull it off somehow. Yeah. Always, it always ends up coming together really, really nicely. I mean, it helps to have really dope people working with you. That, that always, pull always together. Yeah, and yeah. Like, it's nice that we're getting. This is our third, the third year that we've done Solo Fest, and we're wow. starting to get like a nice, solid little crew of people, like. Uh, one of the performers has been coming on to do like uh, video videography for it. Nice. So document the process. And um, there's a couple other people that we've brought in to do like hosting and little things. And it's it's starting to build again. It feels nice. It was COVID really put the brakes on us right before COVID. We were on a roll. We had the Barnes is all theater, which is a 300 C theater. We had that sold out uh, multiple nights wow. and we were like, yeah, we're jamming. We're going, we're going. And then COVID's like, no more live, nothing. Yeah. And that really, that really wiped us out. It did. It, it, it wiped our momentum out. I mean, we were literally like, well, that was with my, uh, the, the second solo show, third show, solo show that I did, which was called smoke. And smoke was really like we were figuring out ways to really pack, you know, that size of a venue. And then it was like, oh, okay, now everybody into your house for two years. You know, and that's yeah. about figuring out how to rebuild that momentum again with the new pieces plus the old pieces. Well, that actually gave us an opportunity to sort of expand on what we do, though, because Ernie started teaching storytelling on Zoom yeah over COVID so that was something that we that we could keep keep doing that sort of that still lived in the same sort of environment as like the solo fest this like the theatrical production because that's like the baby steps of creating a new show is getting the stories out so so we were able to at least maintain thank goodness over COVID with that online work that he was doing yeah, and that's, uh, still, and that's still now folding into more work that we're trying to create. Is that something that you're thinking that you would like to do going forward, like doing a lot more workshops on storytelling, on building your own one person show? Because that's something you could do both in person and on Zoom pretty easily. Definitely. I think that that's my lane. I think, I think it'd be terrific for both of you, honestly. It's just a matter of figuring out how we want to ultimately manifest that. Like, is this something that I'm teaching in college? Is this something that I'm teaching on my own? You know, if so, how do we teach that? You know, how do we get the funding to be able to teach that and, and, and outreach to that? I have some ideas. We've been talking with Glendale Arts about them and they are in motion. I think cool. we we'll start to see sort of buds of it in this coming solo show year. Oh, nice. It's nuts, right? Because now, <clears throat> because I'm I'm part of the, the 
masterminding of this and Candy's part of the masterminding of this, every year I'm tasked with having to write a new show. Oh, no pressure. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. And the shows have to be an hour and change, right? So yeah. hopefully the next one doesn't have as many cues. But <laughs> 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 but um but given that, given that, that 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 space we're looking to expand it to bring in younger solo show artists like college students high school students who yeah are willing to come in and sort of want to construct a you know maybe a 20 minute piece a 30 minute piece that they that we can then put into the festival and have them inviting all of their friends and things that'd like be that. terrific kind of thing yeah so that that's that's the goal that's the idea right and it actually ends up helping the festival overall like building new works that we can potentially put up in future show and future festivals so mm -hmm. and people i mean not to mention i mean the confidence boost that would be for all of the kids so that's I'm the sure. idea that's the idea i always say all the time that like when 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 you engage in this work it doesn't relegate itself to just the stage you know like when you oh no you know can speak in front of an audience that you take that confidence into the world with you well and telling storytelling is like almost everything we're doing in yeah. this world really absolutely like so, when you do your art yeah that's the story that people are looking at you know or it, it, that it's inspiring you know? and being able to speak about it matters so much of being able to talk about anything you're doing i think mm -hmm. that is wonderful so yeah, that's the goal so what is can you sort of walk me through the process of you putting together a show and like start like in general Maybe. i don't know maybe this last one uh, <laughs> i'm yeah. assuming they're all a little different oh yeah they're, yeah, they're, 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 all, they're all very different they're actually. all very different well um the process of generally like i'll get a creative idea a spur and then i'll start writing and inevitably that writing will get to a certain amount of pages or something and then then you have to hand it over <laughs> to people because you know any one idea will instantaneously have 50 million ways that it can be satisfied right so now you're you're having to go okay which one of these, these decisions do i make and which one do i choose and so then 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 I, you have to kind of start letting other people into the process to listen to it and and read it or hear it and things of that nature and um from then when you have enough it, it's been my experience it's like when i have enough of material then I try to go to somebody and go, okay, would you be interested in directing this for me? Because hmm. now you will be on the outside of what I'm doing to be able to see this, have what kind of structure it needs. What's the emotional hmm. movement of the piece? What's the, you know, where, where's the, where are the comedic moments? Why? What is this saying? What is the story as a whole missing? Is there this element that's not in there, that element? right because i usually go about using the um hero's journey mm -hmm. as my structure you know Got so it. a lot of times you'd be like wait but this is missing well this piece over here is what i intended to satisfy that part and it's like well yeah well it doesn't so now you have to, <laughs> you know what i mean so now you have to go in and find that and or or you know expand the idea more than you normally would type of a thing you know it's 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 a it's a strange mm -hmm. it's a strange process because like i would think oh I, i've done this a bunch i know how to do it now it's different every time i'm sure every time it's going to be its own you know birthing process its own life its own ideas its own feeling its own movement you know so you every you're starting from scratch literally every time you start one Luckily for this particular show, 108 Stitches, Ernie was able to reconnect with the director that he had for Have You Like the Weight of a Flame. Nice. Mary Jo Negro is her name. Um, and she's brilliant, a brilliant actress and 
director and Juilliard grad and just wonderful Brooklyn A. Yeah, two-time <laughs> Tony Award nominee. Um, um, nice. Woman. She directed his first show, Have You Liked the Way to the Flame, that toured all over Europe and the U.S. and had he won a handful of awards with that one, right? Yeah. Uh, and the two of them, you should see them. They, they need to have their own show. Just them. <laughs> we like start. Maybe maybe that should be the next thing we do is just start like reality show filming their rehearsals <laughs> because they're hilarious and they have so much fun together. And I think that especially in this particular show, you can see how much fun they had in the rehearsal room on stage. Like it, like the joy of it comes out in the piece and they just, they work really well together and it can be hard to find a good partner, a good, somebody to work with a, a director that can take your words and, and the story that you were trying to tell and actually bring life to it in the way that you expect it to. And she's like, she's like big sister. She was a, a, a professor at USC when I was there. Not in, she was an undergraduate and I was in MFA. She was teaching in the undergrad, but we hit it off instantaneously. And ever since then, you know, she's kind of like, she's very much so like big sister to me when she's, when we're working together that she's like, you know, oh, is that, is that what you thought that scene was about? Well, it's not. <laughs> the scene is this now. And it's like, so even when we disagree, it's still, we have so much fun together. Like even, even when we're disagreeing on something, it's like, okay, we disagree, we disagree, we disagree. Now we're back to the flow of things and, and, and how we sort of moved and philosophizing about what does this mean? What did you, what did you mean with this scene? Oh, this is what, what did you intend with this? This character has now become prominent. So now this character has to have this through line because this character has leaked out of the woodworks and just become prominent and that, you know what i mean it's 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 a really she, she's a great person to go through the process the, the process with because she's a she's brilliant at understanding story yeah so these those who worked out the script and they would have meetings and go back and forth and like she helped to like build the the script with him like he's like i've got all this meat help me make it into Something. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't need this. We don't need that. We don't need that. 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 No, nope, that's cut <laughs> this out. We don't need this and that and this, you know. And then you know, as as much as, you know, I, I'm like, oh no, I don't want to lose that. Oh no, I, I ninety percent of the time, ninety five percent of the time, I'm like, okay, we'll go with that because you know, I kind of I, I have to end up trusting what you do. And so far, the two times that we've worked together, the audience has responded really well. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, she's pretty cool. We take it into the rehearsal room and I start plugging in sound cues and trying to help the him play against the cues. And when we do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until we get it just right. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get to share it. And it's it's long, long, long hours and exhausting this one was particularly exhausting because I, I was also finishing school at the same time yeah you'd been you were doing it pretty seriously graduating she was graduating the year the the, the, the week after the, week the after festival after finished the festival. congratulations and who yeah <laughs> I, I feel like it took me like i feel like just now i'm starting to like get back to like some sort of reg regular rhythm like I've been trying to like get a hold of my life. I feel like ever since then I was like, after this festival's over, then after the graduation, then I'll just be able to relax and like. But of course, we I started a new job, and so that. <laughs> <laughs> so but hopefully, it's not quite as stressful right now. No, it's not. Like actually, right now is. It, it's feeling like starting to like get into some new patterns and new new action new new train lines to jump on nice yeah, yeah. it's been Gee. good it's yeah been good because that was you know like she went through a lot over that time frame it, it ended up being about four years you know she was in school because she went mm -hmm. to get her business certificate first and then after decided to stay and study film and so you know after four years of kind of running on high like that and her trying to balance work life and school life and 
you know, family life and all of those things, Baseball. You, know, <laughs> you know, finally, you know, now, now it's, it, you know, it, it hasn't fully settled yet. Cause it's still new that just happened this summer, but I think that we're now starting to find that, oh, okay. Life can be a little bit less stressful now because yeah. prof has just started back school again. So there's that like every regular everyday event that's a consistent kind of like heartbeat that I feel like I could build off of where he was on summer break and so like our schedules were just like all over the place and I, I like I was like I thought I was gonna be feeling better now but I'm like it's just now like I'm on four months three months three months four months after all of that just yeah. now starting to be like okay yeah it's pretty tough. we can do this we can get back into living life and we're actually preparing um, to bring 108 stitches out to New York. Oh, wow. When is that happening? Well, we're looking to do it somewhere in October, November, around the postseason time for baseball. You know, I think Perfect. It, Makes it, sense. Automatically, it'll work well. Um, so that's in motion. Neat. Uh, we'll, we'll see how and when that actually works out. It's funny, there's people that we know here, Mary Joan, my director, you know, people that she knows here that have seen it here and are seriously like, I'm going to fly to New York to see it. <laughs> Dang, that's wow. amazing. Yeah. And speaking well of what you've been doing. This piece is really, it, it really speaks to a lot of people. There's been really excellent feedback about it. It just, it, it touches, touches your heart. If you've ever cared about anybody and you want to protect them, then you're going to find something to relate to in the piece. So it's it's a lot of fun. Ernie brings in a whole bunch of brand new characters that are based on his real life best real life friends who are characters in real life. And so <laughs> they really it's really nice to see them on stage with him in a sense, right? Because he's embodying them. Mm hmm. It, it brings this whole new energy to the show that is really electric and people are really responding to it. Yeah, my my, my childhood friends are some characters. <laughs> Literally all of them. Wow, that's pretty amazing. All of them. <laughs> like all, all of, it's the weirdest thing to say, but like, you know, you know, have some, some, some of your friends that are like, oh, you know, they're kind of mellow and chill. No. <laughs> No, not amongst this group. Like my my my, it's it's really interesting to to reflect on that as as an adult, you know. But my my core group of friends are all some characters, man. That's pretty amazing. Seriously, yeah, I took well, well, we went to last summer. Candy and me took profit, and you know, to to New York. We were we were going to a tournament in Florida that he was playing in, but. We stopped mm. in New York for about two weeks and um to celebrate our to tenth, celebrate our tenth, tenth wedding. Congratulations. And Thank then you. while we were in New York, I got a bunch of my friends together to play a softball game. And while we were playing the game, you know, her and 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 Prophet were like, You're like all the same people. <laughs> like, you're the same person like it's it's strange like you're all like you finish each other's sentences and you make half remarks and everyone knows what everyone's talking about and it's, wow yeah they're they're um yeah my, my friends are a bunch of characters well, you should man. see them on the ball field too because the freaking insults and <laughs> jokes that fly around <laughs> It was wild. We had such a good time. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it was it was a blast, man. It was a really good time. And now one one oh eight is kind of reflective of that. And now the new show that I'm beginning to write now. Ooh, oh, another. another one. Okay. There's another one that'll be full of my friends and stuff that um that that I've met on the road. The characters, man. Well, this was so one hundred and eight is like childhood friends. Yes yeah baseball baseball core and then this new one is about that those 20 those 20 something friends right that yeah. the era of 20 something i mean a bunch of my childhood <laughs> friends will be in that one oh, too it spills over right because yeah, there's, there's like over. a little crossover over there but but i also met a lot of friends when i left home and 
some of them are also some characters. You might be drawn to characters. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of getting that impression. <laughs> but that's cool. I mean, did you, can you do, when you were watching them play, did you not know some of these people from before? Um, and did you go like, now I know this, who this character is? Uh, <laughs> no, I had met all of them actually, uh, unfortunately, at a funeral a couple years prior. Oh, but, I'm sorry to hear. So, um, but even then, they were still as sad as the situation was. They still found time to laugh together, and and you could just—they're just—it's just such—it's just, just, just so much fun to hang around them. Um, one thing that surprised me though was how much fun Ernie was having on the ball field, and that I was like, oh, I still got a love for it in there somewhere. <laughs> I've been trying to get him to play and he refuses. But but with his friends back home, it's doable. So maybe we'll make that happen again. Yeah, it's tough because like which which 108 kind of touches on a little bit. It's like my my history, my connection to the game is complicated, right? And so because of how massive a, a, a presence baseball was in my life mm -hmm. and in the lives of a bunch of my childhood friends um, when we were teenagers and things of that nature, you know, there, there's, there's certain elements. It's like, I can't, it's the weirdest thing, but I, I, I find difficulty like, okay, well, I'm just going to go play softball now for fun. It's like, if I'm going to play, I want to play really well. <laughs> and if I play really well, that means I have to train and I don't have time to train. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got solo festivals and our son is a baseball player and that's an everyday project, right? And, you know, and she was in school at the time frame. So I didn't really, you know, baseball has this kind of sorted, you know, presence in my life that 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 it, it was fun to play ball with my friends. It was definitely fun because it had so much of the elements that in a way are are taboo you know, in this day and age, you know, like, the and the <laughs> like we, you know, we get, a, we, we get on, under each other's skin. Like, you know, we try to, it's a strictly out of competitiveness, right? You say stuff and you, you know, you dig at each other, you make fun of people making mistakes and things of that nature. And that's really frowned upon in this day and age. But the interesting thing about that is that that grew us all, not only as ball players but as people too, because when we were on the field together, it was, well, I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to beat you by getting in your head, whether that be via insults or whatever. And then after the game is over, everybody's like, yeah, let's go have a beer. <laughs> you know, everybody's like, yeah, let's go eat something. <laughs> you it's know? all fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it, it, and, and I think that it, it's kind of sad for me, actually, in that my son is not growing up in a in in a day and age where he gets to experience what friendship that's laced with that kind of thing has because as cruel as it would seem there's so much an element of really bonding yourself with other people because you know you give each other a hard time like your vulnerability, you know it's I mean? like your vulnerabilities are exposed. Yeah, and everybody's like, yeah, we still love you. You know what <laughs> I mean? It, it was, it, it was. I think 108 stitches is very indicative of a time frame where, you know, the show is growing, so it doesn't particularly have this element yet, but, um, very much so a, a a time frame where a bunch of you and your friends feel like you're growing up in the middle of a war zone. <laughs> You know what I mean, and and what that what that kind of thing does to bonding you with your friends, you know, like Candy and I, the show doesn't touch on it very much, but there's something about um, growing up in a neighborhood where you form the tightest bonds that you have, and everybody forms tight bonds with their friends, right? No matter what geographic location you grew up in but there was something really interesting about like you know creating tight bonds with your friends and then every single day all of you 
knowing that by accident or by some misunderstanding or something that this could literally be the last day you see each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something different within within that kind of a bond of friendship. There's something different in it. So much so that like my friend George is in the show. And George and I don't talk for years. I mean, years and years and years we go without talking. The other day I texted him and I said, because I wanted his blessing on using him in the show. So I texted him and I said, hey, listen, when you get a second, when you get two free seconds, call me. I have to talk to you about something. And within 30 seconds, my phone rang. And we don't talk for years. Within 30 seconds, he was like, what? What happened? And I'm like, no, 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 this is nothing negative. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> not bad. And he was like, oh, okay. He's like, you can't send me cryptic text messages. Like, <laughs> like you, I'm, I'm like, the, my instantaneous reaction is something happened, but it, it's, it's reflective of what I'm talking about, right? That again, he and I don't talk, but our, the way we grew up was so bonded that even 35 years later, I text him something cryptic and he's back to be like, what happened? What's going on? Well, what do we need to do? What do you need? Mm -hmm. I mean, so 108 is still growing in being reflective of that element more so, but it's, um, it, it shows young. It shows yeah. Young. So do you find, uh, Candy Joe, have you seen that with some of his other shows too, how it shifts over time? Oh, for sure. For sure, heavy like the weight of a flame. I want to say the last time he put it up was probably my my favorite performance of it. Oh wow! I had tweaked a couple things that, uh, for some reason, in the initial writing process, they wanted to stay away from including actual Shakespearean lines. But he oh. talked about Shakespeare in that piece, uh -huh. and for years and years and years it was this like in the introduction to Shakespeare was this like kind of roundabout way of like talking Shakespearean but it wasn't anything like directly quoted from any works um but there is a work that is mentioned in the show multiple times and so this last run that he did he finally put the scene that is mentioned he he performed the Shakespearean scene that gets mentioned in the show and it did such a beautiful job of really like solidifying these these certain moments where it gets mentioned. Nice. And it was my favorite performance. And that's one of the great things about live performance in general is that yeah, there's no two shows that are exactly the same. Like this is real life. This is happening in real time. There's no cut. Let's do it again. There's no take two. There's no take five. It's just like one shot real life and mess ups happen and we just kind of we have to go with the flow i think that's one of the great things of um being able to work together us being so close being a married couple is one of those when we're in those moments on stage when things get flipped or skipped or we 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 work so much together that it, it helps i think in those moments that that i can flow and be like okay i guess we're skipping that cue and oh no we're going back and it, uh -oh. we're able to you know we're able to finesse it so that the show still goes off and every performance is still one worthy of praise the admiration the fans are always really excited about them um, and you know, that's one of the best things about live performance is that there's no two shows that are exactly the same because life is living <laughs> and uh, so we're out there doing it. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's something there's a, about theater in general. I think that there's a, you could say there's a little trauma bond there too. <laughs> right? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Especially when you go through those those times, like we said, you know, when we first met, we were so broke, and it's like, okay, I'm gonna give the only X amount of dollars that we have this month that we don't really even have to rent this space and hope that we can entice enough people to to come out to see the show, to be able to pay for the space <laughs> right, or I to mean, pay ourselves back for the space or whatever. And a lot of times it's like, nope, 
you just rented it and you lost the money because nobody showed up, you know, or three people showed up. You know, I remember this one night we were performing at this, this dance studio that we had rented in Hollywood, set up about 25 seats. Showtime rolled around eight o'clock, no one in the, in the space. Even after like text messages and emails and the whole thing, nothing. So we're like, okay, well, I guess that's what it is. And then, you know, let's, let's turn the lights out and go. And right as we were walking out the door, up walked a, a lady that had seen the show before with four of her friends. And, she, and it was five minutes after the show was supposed to start. Like and she was like, well, after, yeah. yeah. Was she was like, hey, we're here. Walking right back in. Okay, well, let me go backstage. Give me about 10 minutes to get into this thing. And here we go full throttle for these five people. You know, it was... You know, other days it was like, well, no one showed. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Well, but now we have sold out, sold out houses. The last three, the last three festivals. That That's pretty had. amazing. Yeah. All, all of Ernie's shows were sold out and we're hoping to continue building that, that fan base. And we're looking forward to really growing that. That's amazing. Process. Wow. Yeah. All right. Crossing fingers for that. <laughs> I know you probably. I'm assuming that in your um, in this next batch of characters, you've been finding other ways that you bond with people, and that create st new stories. Yeah, well, I, I think that the 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 most um, visible part of it for me is more so that like in heavy. And then in Gymesthesia, I had a we, we did a solo show where I played Jimi Hendrix in it. And then Gymesthesia? Um, mm-hmm. It's called Gymesthesia. Awesome. And, <laughs> and, um, and then we had Smoke after that. And in all of those shows, guitar playing was a prevalent uh element to the shows. Oh. 108 has none of that has no good so, so it's like literally like I took a, one dimension of myself completely out of the show but hmm. have to make up for the you know the the, the the part of that 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 the audience that usually knows me expects and figure out how to still feel like I'm giving them giving them a full uh, performance that they're happy with without that element even being part of the show so that to me has been the great one of the greatest sort of like oh man you know how do i do this now right how do i keep you know how, what what's the other musicality to it right nice. so now i'm following it up with the next show that i'm writing that will probably have more guitar playing in it than any show that i've done at all <laughs> so it's just this weird relationship with the with the audience that you know funny. one of the ways that we did that that was 108 stitches is we um we got paired up with this composer um this tamarin mm -hmm. and he has what's the name of his band thumpasaurus uh, he, he has this group called thumpasaurus apparently they're really popular but but yeah That's so fun that he tours with and he created a couple musical element and uh, musical pieces that sprinkle in through 108 stitches that help bring that that musicality back into this piece even though Ernie's not playing guitar in it yeah and the musicality now exists in the interactions between him and the other character which you know, i'll leave as a mystery so people can come see it but it's that you know it, it, that that's where now we have to as the show evolves it's like okay how do we create the exciting movement and musicality of it with this with these two elements and so it's a whole nother it's a whole nother psychological um you know it's a bit of leniency <laughs> so how can people find you how can people find out what you're doing and what your next show is? I mean, they can follow Solo Fest, right? Um, I don't know of Solo Fest. So Solo Fest is officially um, run by Glendale Arts. Okay. And we've been partnering with them to to get it going, and hopefully we can maintain that partnership and everything stays cherry with that. Um, so Glendale Arts would be where you'd go to find out anything else about the Solo Fest for next year. Um, also, we have uh, a website that 
is still sort of under construction. It does its job right now, but um, I'm actually, we're actually, that's somebody that we're bringing in as we're expanding, somebody to help build out the the website. It's lifechild.live. So super easy to to remember since we do live work. That was one of the options. And I was like, what about lifechild.live? And then that's it. So nice. that's where you find Life Child and the, uh, little bits of the work we do. And I try my best to keep that updated with the newest information. Um, we're on Instagram also. Yep. Um, child 777. Life Child 777 is Ernie's personal account. My personal account is the Sugar Shock. And then we also have accounts for each of the shows. So there's a heavy like the weight of the flame account. There's 108 stitches, stitches the play. There's smoke the play. Uh, and also there's lifechild.live Instagram. Nice. So all of those are like sort of right now, they're like still in the works. And the most the most developed ones are our personal accounts, which which stem which spill over into work, obviously, because that's really the point of having those accounts is to get more visibility so that people will come and see our work. Um, but it is also our personal accounts touch on personal things outside of work, which I think helps to show the world that we are well rounded individuals and that we're not just robots making content. <laughs> there is that. Uh, so yeah, so livechild.live is is our is our home base and awesome. Way to find us. Yeah, it'll be really good. You know, because we were talking at the very beginning before we started recording about how we grow from these points. It's like, how can people help you grow? Yeah, that's a good question. One of our, one of the guy that actually we're working with on the website suggested a Patreon, starting a Patreon. Uh, and that's something that's something as independent producers that we've struggled with a lot actually is finding finding more funding to help us continue making our work. Uh, and it really it helped a lot um, while we were being fiscally sponsored with Glendale Arts because we could have companies make tax deductible donations, which is a huge selling point when you have a lot of money, you need tax deductible. Yep. <laughs> and so that's actually something that we're tentatively working on. Our, our our work is so focused on giving back to the community. Like we we practically do this work for nothing. Like we barely make our bottom line of just paying for the theater and for all of the other artists that we work with. And so it it really is something that we do from our hearts and um, we need to find more ways to get other people, you know, financially involved in, in helping to support the work that we do because we want to grow it. We want to keep growing it and keep making it a place where we can keep sharing Ernie's stories and have more, more stories with, with faces that aren't prevalent and stories that aren't prevalent. I mean, we're sick of hearing the same stories over and over and over and over again. There's so many beautiful stories in the world. And yeah. we want to keep sharing them. So hopefully we can get that all sorted out. One of the ways you can support us is by coming to see our work. And and that is that's always it's always good to have bodies in the seats and a really a full audience really plays into the performance of the show and it as skilled as he is for one person in the in the house he's off the charts when it's when he's got lots of energy to play off of so that's always better right oh. all right so here's to finding more funding um and finding more ways that we can make this actually happen and grow and i'm looking forward to hearing about maybe classes and workshops that you can give on storytelling maybe that'd be another thing that can help yeah. fuel that fire that'd be great and you know feed us all of these important things right give us more give us more right. well <laughs> i i know it's uh, like no pressure <laughs> but we're at least we're trying our best we're implementing self-care it's a new new words that we're 
shoving into our vocabulary to make some more space for our yeah. um, sanity in this process and making sure that we're not overdoing it, but that we're still out there producing and and creating really, really spectacular one of a kind works of art. I know you can do it. Uh, yes. Take, make sure you take the rest you need because otherwise it's going to be really hard to create much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the area is good. Thank but you so much. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. This was wonderful.